Um, I actually ate lunch quickly um, before I had to present. Um, and so today we're going to talk about options and strategies and income uh, generating. And of course, I'm the chief options instructor for DTI, and I've been doing this for a little over three years, which is hard to believe how quick time moves. And what I want to do today is I want to do, and just give me a second to make sure we're projecting well. There we go. What we're going to do is talk about credit spreads to generate income, and I also added in here an occasional dinosaur trade. You know, uh, I've had people talking about elephant trades. Well, believe it or not, there's an occasional dinosaur trade. And that doesn't mean a trade that existed once and doesn't exist again. It means pretty huge trades. And so every once in a while, one of your income trades will, uh, will turn into a leviathan, so to speak. Um, and again, that is not my primary purpose, but I'll talk about that a little bit. And as an option trader, you can learn how to manage these things. We have some really, really good presenters here in Trading Pub. I wish I had more time to listen to it on a Saturday. But uh, I will tell you that we have some really good presenters and, and well-known people. And so what I'm going to be talking about is options and kind of give you a mini course in credit spreads to help you to start looking at these as a way of managing trading and managing portfolios and generate an income. Now, I do want to give our brief risk disclaimer. Know that all this stuff has risk and we try to teach you as much as possible about risk management. And I'm going to talk a little bit of risk management here, but I'm limited by uh, you know, 40, 50 minutes. So I usually spend a lot of time with risk management when I'm teaching a class, but I'm going to give you some way to look at risk with credit spreads. Also, one of my takes on all this stuff is the best thing to do with risk is to get as educated as you can, and you folks are doing that, learn and apply good risk ma management. And the third thing is manage your emotions. Those are the three best things you can do to help yourself with risk. Just briefly about myself, I am a professional options trader as well as a clinical psychologist, kind of an interesting combination. Really always had an interest in the markets all the way back down to um, high school, believe it or not when they first introduced us to the Wall Street Journal in an economics class and uh, went through different things I wanted to be when I was a kid, from being an astronaut to being a physician to being an attorney, and I turned out to be a psychologist and options trader. Who knew? Anyway, um, <laughs> interesting hearing a kid go to their parents and say, I want to be an astronaut or the president. It makes sense. They say they want to be a trader. It's like, what? You want to be a traitor or a trader? Anyway, so I have a lot of interest in the psychology of traders, and I've gotten very, very involved with this in terms of advanced technology, brainwave technology, and really have been working on some amazing things. But I got into options trading, really, and, and in trading in general, because I started getting nervous about what I saw was happening in healthcare quite some time ago, probably 15, almost 20 years ago, um, the changes that were occurring. People don't know how far back this goes. And... Really, I was concerned because I was a younger individual, would I have a retirement? And what do you do when you're self-employed and you're generating income? There's no one paying my way. I've always had to pay my own way. So as a result of that, I had to learn certain ways to trade. And I finally gravitated to options trading because it helped to bridge the gap between doing a job that you might be doing in your present career and then also starting into trading. And I tried day trading and that was fine. but very, very hard to blend that, to go day trade in the morning and see patients in the afternoon. So I, I really generated into uh, options trading. And as our pre previous speaker spoke about, a lot of us do swing trading, so we're not having to sit there and micromanage trades and trade every minute of every day. And it provides you a way to in generate income and also to swing trade. Now, one of the things I want to say is, and, and just as a recommendation to all of you, Try to uh, set up a plan of action for your trading. You know, even if it isn't options, in this case I'm going to be focusing options, but select one strategy to master and really work on that strategy. For me, a lot of times I will encourage my students to look at vertical spreads. And then to begin with maybe an equity or an index ETF first, and then you can go to futures or commodities, but really understand this stuff. Another very important thing, and I've mentored for many years as well as taught, is developing mastery over your trading platform. Many times I've run into people who really, everybody's so eager to trade, they really don't have your um, have a very, very good uh, trading platform. 
if you need me to yell out louder, I've got a very loud voice, so I'm trying to keep it down, <laughs> trying to keep my psychologist soothing voice versus my booming, you know, wild blue horseshoe voice. So if I start to drift off, just let me know. Uh, but basically, you know, you want to really get good at your trading platform, and there are different ones out there, and talk to people who trade, professionals who trade, and find out what they like and what's best. Also, the other thing I suggest is to try to get about 85% consistency over your, your first uh, strategy. Um, really develop that command of the strategy because you've seen some really good presenters and over the weeks there's been very, very good presenters here at Trading Pro. Uh, Morgan's done a wonderful job of bringing some really quality people here. But when you learn certain candle patterns or certain TTM patterns that Carter does or things like that, one of the things you want to do is get consistent with what you're doing. There's many ways to be able to identify patterns on charts. There's no one way. At DTI, the roadmap is used. There's many different ways. So don't feel that one is more superior than the other. Use what's comfortable for you, and which really helps to enhance your profitability. Also, when you're dealing with options, I always encourage to have people to do at the money, long options, and then out of the money, short options. It's the safest way when you're beginning. So when you're doing shorting options, it's best to use the out of the money ones when you're going long options, <clears throat> excuse me, you use at the money ones. Now there are all there are ways to modify this, and I've taught this for many years, but I'm trying to blend this for people who might be a little bit newer to options, as well as some of those who know options and just talk about what I like and what I find works. Also create a trading plan and stick to your plan. I should have plan in there. Stick to what you plan. Okay. You know, don't keep modifying it. You know, decide what you want to do. There are these elephant trades, as John called them. I'm joking around, called one a dinosaur trade, a giant trade. And there's other people who talk about this. You know, just try to start to get profitable, whether you're a swing trader or a day trader, and then start branching out. It, this is a lot of information to assimilate, particularly if you're new, all these trading types of things. And I'm really a, a strong uh, proponent of keeping your approach simple. Really keep your approach simple. Um, and I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible. Now, before we get uh, started, and in the interest of simplicity, let's just talk about a little bit of the definitions and possibly the variables that you need to understand related to um, credit spreads. Okay. Now, a few other things. I just want to do a little housekeeping in terms of options. And that basic terminology. There's two prices, and we'll drill down on this, and I'm going to go right into the spreads. But there's what's called the strike price. And what that is is that's the contract exercise price. So there's actually two prices involved with options, one which is called the exercise price or the contract price. So you might hear a 250 call contract or a 250 put contract. That number 250 refers to the strike price. There's also a cost of that. And, and notice I call these contracts. There's contracts in business. These are the same things. There's contracts. There's a buyer of a contract and a seller of a contract. And whenever you buy a contract, you pay a certain cost for it, which is what we call a premium. When you buy an insurance policy, believe it or not, you pay a premium. That is the cost. Now, that premium that you pay may be $1,000, but you may be protecting $100,000 with that premium. So the same way, you know, your strike price may be 250 but your premium may only be $5. So just to kind of get you in that mindset. Also, if they pop up here in some of the slides, ITM means in the money, ATM means at the money, and OTM means out of the money. And basically all these things mean is if the actual strike price, let's say the 250, I'm just arbitrarily pulling that out, the $250 strike price and the underlying, whatever it is, Apple, Google, is at $250, that's right at the money. If the option starts to go in the money, that might mean that that stock, that underlying stock, goes to 260, and now your option's at 250. So now that's in the money by $10 or 10 points. By the same token, if it were to drop down and you're looking at the 250 option, now that option, because the stock's now dropped to 240, is out of the money. So, And that's what we mean by that out of the money, in the money, and at the money. And I just want to give you an idea if you ever hear people talking about that. A little bit of simplicity. I also, um, I would also say that when you're talking about these um, types of uh, strategies, 
this is not really meant to be a basic course. We went back and forth to whether I should do a basic presentation here or a swing presentation. And really, Morgan and I decided to let's show people how to make some income return. And that's why we're doing this one. If you don't understand some of these basics, DTI has a real, I put a real nice together, uh, together a nice basic course, very inexpensive. You can purchase it on DVD. I'm not here to sell that today, but just to let you know, you know, if, if some of this stuff is Greek to you, and that's a pun intended because they call the variables and the equations that you determine option premiums as Greeks, then just realize that it, it, you might want some more basic stuff. But I wanted to show you this because we have all these people talking about swing trading and the things John was talking about, and, and you really need to learn how to do some basic um, uh, vertical trades that could generate some income for you. Now, one of the things that you have, and looks like we skipped over one, it's called the option chain. And so when you want all the information you need on an option, on most platforms you can pull up what they call a chain. And it has most of the information you need, and most of these are modifiable now. So it has you know, the strike price, the premium, how much volume is there, how much open interest is there, what the expiration date of the contract is, all that information is right there. And here's an example of one of those options chains. This is a while back on Amazon. And by the way, the color differences, these are all the in the money calls. When I talked about ITM, and here's all the out of the money calls. And then these are all the out of the money puts. And then the blue is all the in the money puts. And you can see there's a lot of information here, the bid and the offer. You know, the delta, we'll talk about this for a minute, implied volatility, open interest, volume. And so you, and here's all the strike prices. So you basically have most of the information that you need in order to make these trades. And don't be overwhelmed by this if you're new, because as a newbie, you may only look at one or two of these strikes. Anyway, you're not going to be looking at all these strikes, but you want all the information. And by the way, this is a wealth of information, people. This is a wealth of information. Uh, I, I'm missing some of the uh, questions. Uh, I won't go into heavy into platforms, but I use every platform. I have used uh, Interactive Brokers, Thinkorswim, Options Express, E-Trade, Fidelity. Um, I've used them all, and I can trade on all of them. Um, I kind of like the Interactive Brokers, or what they call Garwood one, because it's very, very flexible, and I can program in it. Uh, I know some people like TradeStation. Uh, I think uh, some people like Thinkorswim. You know, it depends on where you are. And that's a good question to ask um, of someone who's a mentor. What's the best platform? Because it also depends on how sophisticated you are. Because some of these platforms will overwhelm you. Um, this is the typical pattern you will see on a Garwood or a Thinkorswim or an Interactive Brokers. And most of them are modifiable. Now, just to reiterate again, what is the strike price? Um, the strike price is the options exercise price. So if you're buying a call, that's a price which a call buyer can actually exercise the option. Now, by the way, this can be on a stock. It can be on a commodity in the future. We're going to keep it simple talking about stocks. But you can do it on different underlying instruments. The put, basically, you're buying the right to sell an underlying stock, commodity, or future. And always keep in mind when you think about this stuff that we're talking about uh, contracts. It's a contract to buy and a contract to sell. Whereas when you're buying a stock, you're actually buying the underlying. You own 100 shares of that company. All right? If you buy a future, you're rarely buying the big future contracts. What you're doing with the future is you're putting down a deposit to trade a futures contract. When you're dealing with options, you're actually buying that contract. You are the owner of that contract, or you are selling that contract. You are the seller of that contract. And by the way, you can sell and buy these. In this case, to keep it simple, what I'm telling you is a call is a right to buy a stock at a certain price within a certain time frame, and a put is a right to sell a certain stock at a certain time frame. Um, Option premium, and here's another thing. This is what you actually pay for your contract. So it's the actual price of the option contract. There are mathematical models, which are basically algebraic models. And by the way, things that are called Greek, Greeks, in algebra, you use variables. Well, there aren't enough variables, uh, you know, enough letters to really not get confused between letters of the alphabet and letters that should represent variables. Because in an algebraic equations, there are constants. There, there are variables. So what they did is in science, and this is in math and science, what they've done is they've used Greek letters of the alphabet in order to rep represent certain variables in the equation. So typically, 
you know, the constants are like our coefficients are A, B, C, and then the variables are X, Y, and Z. Most of you probably remember that back to high school. Hopefully you do, um, or college. But what do you do when you need more variables? Well, you use letters of a different alphabet. And I always joke around and say, but what do the Greeks do? Well, fortunately, they do the same type of thing. You know, they're not using our letters of the alphabet. Mathematics is kind of a universal knowledge. So the premium is what you pay. And it's based on these algebraic models. And I say used by floor traders. I probably should change that now and say made by, used by brokerage firms. There's about 12 different models. Well, the amount that you would pay is basically called the premium. And the premium has two parts to it. Okay, One is called an intrinsic value. That's the actual amount that that option is in the money. So if you have a $250 option and the stock's at $250, it has no intrinsic value. Basically, if you were to exercise that option that day, you wouldn't get anything for it because they're right at the same level. Most options, until they become in the money or all options, it's all extrinsic value, and that's really time decay. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So time is the big variable with options that doesn't play into other kinds of instruments. But when you're using credit spreads, in credit spreads, we do much better by focusing on time decay. Now. When you're talking about this, you have other things that go with this. If you think about the um, about a stock, you have a certain volume or market breadth. So there may be, I don't know, 40 million shares of Apple that trade a day. Well, option contracts and even futures have a certain amount of volume. That's market depth. depth. And what that does is it tells you how many of those contracts are trading during the day. A very important thing about volume is it shows you where the interest is. Now a lot of time most of your volume is right at the money because that's where most of the activity is and it'll shift as the price of the underlying shifts. But it gives you a good insight into what's happening at the time. Now what's different from options than from stocks is that there's something called open interest. There may be a lot of uh, contracts trading during the day. However, at the end of each day there's only a certain number of those contracts that are left open. So there are buyers of contracts and there are sellers of contracts. If there's a match, I might sell to open and then I might buy to close. And basically, you go from one contract to zero contracts. So although stocks have a fixed number of uh, volume that you can trade during the day, I'm sorry, a variable number of volume, there's only so many total um, issues that are out there. And if you want more shares of stock overall, they have to have a meeting of the board and, and discuss a split or adding, uh, selling more stock out there. Whereas with options, there it's really unlimited that is, as long as there's someone who wants to sell to open an option contract or someone who wants to buy to open, there's options out there. So that also gives you a good idea of what's happening longer term. So during the day, you'll have a lot of churning, a lot of volume going on. But then, later on, you might see as, as the stock or the underlying future or commodity moves around that the open interest drops. In fact, John Carter was talking about looking for uh, certain options out there that have lower open interest as he was doing different ranges of strikes. And there's actually a reason why you do that. And you do that because you want strikes sometimes not to be hit or you want the demand to increase so that the value of the premiums increase. So, And that's kind of an advanced concept, so I don't go into that at this level of things because it's a little bit too much for people to assimilate. The next thing is the expiration date. All of these options have an expiration date. So basically, they're contracts. So as, as all contracts go, if you have an insurance policy on your house, let's say, okay, and on that insurance policy on your house, you uh, let me turn my volume up just a touch. It looks like Morgan asked me to flick it up just a much. If it gets too loud, y'all just give me a give me a holler and I'll. I'll... Lower it a little bit. Right, I boosted it up a little bit. If it's if it's too loud, let me know. I don't want to be playing too much with volume. Um, so um, and and there's a lot of questions. I'm. I'm not avoiding the questions. I just know how many slides I have to get done. I don't mind answering questions at the end. You can post them again. It's uh, it, it's it's uh, as a, uh, options are very interesting. People have a lot of questions. By the way, I think there was one question there. Which is more important, volume and open interest? It depends on what you're wanting to do with the option. 
You know, if you're day trading, then volume may be more important. If you're doing more of a swing trading or a credit spread, open interest may be more important. Um, they also tell you different things. Volume tells you what's happening more short term in terms of where the interest lies. Open interest tells you more longer term or where the interest lies. It can also tell you where an underlying may be pinned at expiration. So there's a lot of things about, I spend probably well over an hour talking about volume and open interest in my class. So it's complicated. So uh, you know, I'm not trying to avoid anything. I, I could, uh, Morgan will tell you, I could talk for 40 hours about options and not run out of things to teach you. Um, but I'm just trying to quickly cover it. Um, because uh, I don't want to get too di too diverted or distracted because I can tell you I can't. All right, just a little bit more about expiration dates. The expiration dates vary, and I'm just telling you this to make you aware. Um, there's weekly options now. There's monthly options. There's quarterly options. All of these options expire at different times. Most of the options that I'll be looking at are monthly options, particularly when I'm dealing with newer students or newer traders because they're more forgiving. It's a little easier for them to do. They're less likely to get eroded by time decay. I hate to see people get hammered by time decay. And for that reason, I, I really try to um, be very, very careful of, of um, how much I make people do weekly options, although there is value in weekly options. Um, again, depending on whether you're doing an equity or stock option, an index option, a future option, or even, a, even a, a, a quarterly or weekly, they all vary. So I always say start with the monthlies because it's the easiest thing to understand. Now you can go to the CBOE website and you can get this calendar or a variety of other places and it tells you when they're the expirations, it tells you when the weeklies expire, it tells you when the monthlies expires, it tells you about AM and PM options and I encourage most people who trade options to print out this calendar. It also tells you when there's a holiday, well that sounds silly, but as, as a person who, who has two careers, it's nice for me to know that you know on February 18th there's a holiday. If there's a holiday then that means there's no trading going on that day. I often see patients on Mondays anyway so that's not as much of a problem but it's good to know that because if I'm planning a trade especially if you're doing a weekly option you want to know if there's a three-day weekend because they price that into the premiums. So again you can pull this information up if you don't find it on CBOE just do a Google of options expiration calendar and you can update them. Now a very, very important point I want to make, and now we're really going to get into the meat and potatoes of, of credit spreads. Very, very important point. Basically, as I said, I like to talk about risk management and loss, and I'm only basically touching about this right now. But when, a, when an option that you've shorted goes in the money, okay, you want to be able to calculate the net loss of that option. So a lot of speakers here, you know, they talk about all the positive stuff. Well, because I'm a psychologist, I'm not negative about anything, but you know, you want to know if there's a bump in the road before you hit that bump. So basically, if you want to know what the loss is on a credit spread, and I'll give you an example of this. Basically, you look at how much you get on the shorted option. So when you sell an option or you short an option, you bring in a certain amount of money. When it goes in the money, the amount by which that goes in the money, that actually can become a loss depending on how you manage this. So basically, if an out of the money option that you're shorting goes in the money, however much it's in the money, let's say it's $2, then whatever you got as a premium that you took in when you sold it, because remember now you're like the guy who sells the insurance policy to the homeowner, whatever you took in, you have to subtract that from the amount that's in the money. So let's say it's 50 cents. So therefore your net loss is a buck 50. And we'll look at a couple of examples of this. And I just want you to make you aware of this, that you know, how do you know what the loss might be as you're looking at these particular types of trades? So, you know, you kind of think about risk versus reward. You know, while credit spreads actually can be very safe, and that's what we're going to be talking about here, vertical credit spreads, and they can be conservative trades, they also can be risky. So I want to you know, acknowledge up front that if you're not totally understanding of how to do this, follow exactly what I tell you and exercise caution and understand these, this slide and the next one because it's very important. The closer you sell to the money or to at the money of an option, when I'm talking about selling a put or selling a call, the greater return you can achieve but also the greater risk you have. All right? The greater return but greater risk. Um, and, and actually, um, selling an option is not like buying a put. Correct. Thank you, Larry. Um, they're two different things. And so, and again, I, I want to show you the power of this. 
I mean, I have sold a basic options course in this trading pub for $49, a two and a half hour options course. I'm not here to be always making money. In fact, I don't make any money on this to be. I mean, if you really look at, I can make just as much of my practice as teaching this. I actually started teaching some psychologists and doctors this, believe it or not, because they were worried like I was, and now they're even more worried with what's happening in Washington, how they're going to make a living. So I kind of got into this surreptitiously in the training of this, and then finally DTI asked me, hey, why don't you teach a course? You're good at this. Good at, good at not just trading, but also teaching, and that's how I got into this. And I really, I would encourage you to learn some basic stuff before you jump into these, but I just want to give you an idea of something I do on a regular basis and it, it's successful for me and many for, many times for my students. Um, credit spreads are not always home run trades, and you have to understand that, okay? Not all of these are your elephant trades. In fact, they're really not designed to be elephant trades. What they're designed to be is consistent base hits. So yes, you may hit a home run here or there. You may get an ele bag an elephant here or there, but the idea is is to get to first base and then get to second and third and then you you know a lot of games are run a lot a lot of games in baseball are run by base hits. If you watch football, you know rarely will you go ahead and have a you know an end or somebody run the whole length of the field for every play. They slowly move up the field and that's how a game is won. Um, that being said, Big losses can erase months of good trades, and you have to remember that. So you don't want to do one of these spreads, or actually any kind of trade, to be honest with you, even with a future, and erase months of a lot of work. If you cannot be available to manage these kind of trades, I'm going to actually show you some of this stuff in a few moments, then always put a stop in. Better to get stopped out if you can't manage them. If you can manage them, then I would encourage you to manage them because every option trade can be a winning trade if you can manage them. For those who are fortunate enough to be sitting there and monitoring these things on a regular basis and may do like John says or other people do, do, these, do the day trading, well, guess what? You can, if you're sitting there trading futures, you can monitor these trades and essentially you'll never have a losing trade because you know how to hedge them. So again, if you can't be there, use stops, folks, or use a hedge. It's good common sense. It's good risk management. So let's look at a quick example of this just to help you out a bit. Okay, and give me one minute because I'm projecting this in a different sort of way because we can crash the room, believe it or not, if we, have, uh, if we put these slides in the room. Okay, so here's an example. Let's say you're trading Netflix. And it's April 250 by 250 call credit spread. So basically what we're doing is we're selling to open the 250 call and we're buying to open the 260 call. And so basically we bring in a premium of $2 and, I'm sorry, $3.20 and we're buying a hedge basically for $1.20. So the premium we bring in is $200. So every contract we sell, we're we have a, a maximum profit that can, we can get of $200. And that's really how this works. You're selling one option that's out of the money. You're buying another option that also likely is out of the money. And then you're going to go ahead and bring home a premium. Now, why do we do these spreads versus just then selling a naked call? Well, you do this for two reasons. Number one, it requires less margin in your account. You have to be put up... Um, a margin to trade this. So if you want one at one contract, you've got to put $1,000 worth of margin up. Now that stays in your account and you get a little interest on it. Not a whole lot nowadays, but you get some interest on it. But they want you to put something up if this trade goes wrong because technically you could lose $1,000. Now if you're managing it right, that shouldn't happen. But what we like to do is we like to have have a spread rather than a naked because for this you only need a thousand dollars of margin if you had just sold the 250 you would need twenty five thousand dollars of margin so this is a way to reduce your margin and if god forbid the stock took off to the moon you you have a controlled limited risk and that's one of the reasons why we always do these spreads it's not always because it's cheaper even with the debit spread it's to cover your butt basically now, that's explaining how you get this premium in. Now, let's talk about looking at the loss. If a loss is incurred, let's say that short an option, let's say Netflix now pops above that 250 call that you sold. Now that's popped above there. So now it's in the money, and that's why I put it in red. It's in the money now. So we have what we call intrinsic and extrinsic values. Remember I told you when an option goes in the money, it starts to develop an intrinsic value. That means it has a real value because now that is worth not only the premium that you paid but or that you took in, 
but also the amount by which that goes in the money. So let's say you got into this trade, God forbid, and Netflix pops to $252. All right, now that thing that had basically no intrinsic value now gets $2 more of intrinsic value. So now you're down $2. Now, fortunately, the premium you received for the 250 call was $3.20. And the premium you paid for the 260 call was $1.20. So in this case, since it only moved $2 and assuming it stays there, then therefore you would be flat the trade. Okay? Because you brought in that premium, you subtract that premium that you brought in plus the one you paid for the long against how much that went against you. So basically, and this can vary, the loss is the amount of the shorted option is in the money beyond the net premium that you receive for the spread. So basically here it moved two points, you brought in a net premium of $3.20. If it stays right at 252, you don't lose anything. If it starts going up above that, then you could lose some. And I just wanted to give the conceptual analysis of this. Okay? Uh, no, in this case, Spencer, you'd have to sell it. Because if you sell a call, you're selling the right to buy, and therefore you would be short in Netflix, actually, with this particular example. So if it's selling a call, you wouldn't have to buy it. You'd have to short it. Now, you could also buy back that call as well. If you wanted to, you could just buy back the call. Okay, so there's two ways to do this. I would encourage not doing that unless you don't know how to hedge it. Okay? Um, now, now if it's, you can let this position expire and you would be flat to trade. You wouldn't have lost anything. I'm going to show you a trade on Netflix that may be, well, actually it's going to be a dinosaur trade, and it doesn't always happen where you could actually turn a pretty bad situation into a pretty good situation. It's actually a real situation that occurred about a week or so ago. Let me talk briefly about delta. There are little numbers. Basically, an at-the-money option has a delta of about 0.5. What does that mean? Well, basically what that means is, is every time the stock moves a point, the option moves the, or the option premium increases 50 cents. Now, the most important thing about that we want to know about that delta is it also reflects the probability that the option uh, ex, is, ex, is going to expire in the money. Okay, so if there's a 0.5 delta, that means there's a 50-50 chance that that option is going to expire at the money or go in the money. Actually, it's more at the money. Now, also, another thing, if you're dealing with calls, your delta is positive, a positive number. If you're dealing with puts, it's a negative number. It's always a number between negative 1 to 0 for puts and 0 and 1 for calls. And so depending on how much that goes in the money, then your delta increases, or how much it goes out of the money, it decreases. And really, we use this as option traders often to tell us what is the probability of, if, in fact, if you double that delta, you'll know the probability that that strike's going to be touched between the moment you're looking at it and the expiration date. And I'm putting this a little bit about the delta in there, because basically we subtract the delta, the one we buy, from the one we sell, and we get a net delta. So in spread trades, you end up with a net delta, whether it be a debit spread or a credit spread. So with debit spreads, you want a larger net delta, meaning subtracting the one strike's delta against the other strike's delta. With credit spreads, you want a smaller net delta. And I put that in green because we're going to be talking about credit spreads. The small, you basically don't want this thing to move very much so that you don't lose anything if it starts going against you. You can't always achieve what you want, and I put that in there as a caveat. You can't always achieve this, but that's what we're always shooting for. With debit spreads, which we're not going to talk about today, we want a larger net delta. With credit spreads, we want a smaller net delta. Now, a very important thing about these spreads trades is time, particularly credit spreads. Well, actually, all spreads. What separates options from futures, from commodities, from stocks, is they have expiration dates. So what separates them from every other instrument is time. Now the good part about this is that the, as a seller of the option, as a credit spread trader, I get time on my side. That's another reason why I said I like to do monthly options instead of weekly options. Weekly options force you in a more of a day trading situation, whereas the monthly options put you more in a swing trading situation. It also gives you more time to hedge a position, and I'll show you that with Netflix in a few minutes. One of the things about these options is they have what they call time decay. And this line represents time decay. Well, you can see that time decay really accelerates the most in the last 30 days. 
So what we try to do, so and that curve is a curve of time decay. It's the one variable that we call theta in that algebraic equation when we're determining premiums. So bottom line is, is that when you're shorting options, when you're shorting or writing options or doing credit spreads, you try to be one to two months out. And then if you have to, you can roll into further months. So you don't want to be out too far because you also want that time decay to play into your favor. So I honestly don't like just a week worth of time, honestly, having traded for a long time. I prefer to have a month or so. And I've gone up to three months, depending if I want it more of a portfolio trade. Um, also, I'm not going to get into all of this, but basically, whenever you're shorting or writing an option, you short term rather than long term options. Okay, so the shorter you can. Now, if you want to be real short term, you can do weekly options. And one of my buddies, Charlie Finn, who also uh, works with me at DTI, one of my protégés, I'm just teasing you, Charlie, if you're here, um, he does a lot more of those weekly options because he's retired and that's all he does. I'm a psychologist, so part of the time I'm working with patients, the other part of the time I'm setting up trades and teaching. So I've got a little bit different of a situation. Also, there's what we call volatility, and I'll briefly talk about that, and skew, and I won't go into all this, but you also think about volatility. You, you really want to short volatility, if you can, with these options, or play volatility into earnings. Um, that brings us to volatility. It was another question. What would be the advantage of owning the stock and selling covered calls? Well, Franklin, there's a lot of different things, and I could get into that. If you have a good amount of money, and you want to have a core holding, then a covered call is very good where you buy the stock and you sell the call. The only problem with a covered call is you can't short. You only can go long. So a covered call is a neutral to slightly bullish strategy. It's not a, it's not a bearish strategy. So the advantage of a credit spread over a covered call is you can go both ways. You can go long and short. You also can have stocks put to you which will let you go short the stock, and then you can do a covered call, or you can have stocks called away and, 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 and go short the stock. A lot more flexible. If you're in a covered call, even though you're taking a premium, let's say the stock drops 20 points overnight. Even though you're taking a small premium on that call you sold, you're annihilated on the stock, whereas with these credit spreads, you have more control. It's a, contro a much more of a controlled risk. Now, this brings us to volatility. And what is volatility? Most of you are probably familiar with beta or the volatility of a stock. Well, volatility, what they do is the brokerage firms try to determine how volatile an option premium will be in the future, okay? Yeah, and, and, and Jana, that's one of the reasons why we record this, because we have limited time. I could spend two hours just on this. In fact, I have a credit spread course I've taught before for DTI. I did it in Orlando about two years ago. It took eight hours to teach that course. But I want you to get an understanding of how powerful this is. And I've turned people into masters of credit spreads in eight hours. I can do it. But I want you to understand this because I think it's a very valuable strategy. So volatility is the amount by which they think that premium is going to go up and down. And typically, volatility gets heavier as you're going toward, uh, as you're going toward earnings or some known event. And here what I've shown is just what it's called implied volatility, and it's just showing you the percentage of implied volatility. And you can see how it varies. And that variation is actually what we call volatility skew, which if you put this on a distribution, if you graph this, you'd end up with a skewed distribution. Again, I won't belabor that because I actually go into detail in my class with volatility uh, skew and surface volatility. But you can see as you go more in the money how the volatility increases go more out of the money, the volatility, come more at the money, the volatility flattens and goes more. So just to tell you that there's something called volatility there, one thing we do as a seller of options is we try to sell volatility, and we also, in addition, sell time. So we're selling volatility and we're selling time, and that's why I talk about time decay and volatility, because they're one of our friends. The buyers of the options actually have that as a disadvantage. We have as an advantage. Now, one thing I want to say, even though I'm going to encourage credit spreads right hit now, is always choose the correct strategy. Sometimes a debit spread is better. Sometimes a butterfly is better. Sometimes an iron condor. I don't want to get real confused. I want you to show you the simplest, most income returning strategy I've ever found, and that's credit spreads. Okay? So always try to choose the correct strategy. There are many advantages, and I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail of these because of time, but there's many advantages of why I trade credit spreads. They're very flexible. You can use them in volatile markets, 
and you'll keep from getting stopped out a lot more. And there's certain times where you do them and certain times when you don't do them. But you can hedge these things. You can turn an iron condor into a, into a one-wing spread. You can turn these credit spreads into iron condors. You can hedge them with long positions. They are extremely flexible. So there's a lot of saving graces with these. So that being said, let's talk about a credit spread. All right, a vertical bear call credit spread. So what this is, is you buy an out-of-the-money call, and we sell an out-of-the-money call. And you can be one to three months out. I'm going to actually show you an example of Apple that was three months out. Just to give you an idea of, of you know, if you want more of a portfolio trade and you have large numbers of contracts you don't want to hop in and out, then do two to three months. If you're someone who has maybe 10 or less contracts, then one month is fine, unless you can't get your, your um, premium. Also, these are not ratio spreads, so if you sell one, you've got to buy one. If you sell two, you've got to buy two. You want an equal number of contracts on each leg. You also, when you sell this and you bring in this credit we talk about, never do this for less than 40, 40 cents. And really, these same rules apply to the put credit spreads as well. And also, notice that call credit spreads are bearish here, and put credit spreads will be bullish. So when I sell calls, I'm bearish. When I sell puts, puts I'm bullish. Also, your net delta, when you subtract these two out, you want a delta as close to 0.25 or less as possible. Also, your exits, you, if, if the whole thing stays out of the money, you can exit expiration and bring the whole premium in. Or you can get a 50% return on your risk, or basically on your loss, or return on, of, your, of your premium you take in, and you can exit it. Or you can exit at one half the time. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. I actually had some exit slides, and I realized I'd never get to them talking about all the different exits. I do have one slide to help you out here. But basically, this is these are the parameters. Now, just looking at a, a real example of this, when you look at the, you can, you know, as you're looking at the, um, the video of this, you can stop your video and take some time to digest this. But I wanted to give you some examples. So here's Apple. So this is actual real trade, uh, and I, I bought the January 230 calls, sold the 190 calls. You can see how long ago this way. It was about three years ago or two years ago. Notice that both of these are out of the money. Notice they both have the deltas, and notice one is a debit and one is a credit. So the net delta, when you subtract these two deltas, you ended up with 27, a delta of 27. Now, remember I said I like a delta of 0.25 or less. The reason why I was willing to do this is because I knew that Apple was bullish. And sometimes when you're trying, and this is a bearish strategy, I actually did an iron condor on this. I'll talk about this in a minute. So this actual trade was part of an iron condor. But it also can be used so you can look at an iron condor, which is just combining two trades. So typically I want 0.25 or less. In this particular case, because I was going out three months, I was willing to do that. But I did put it in red so you don't forget that I prefer you to have 0.25 or less in your net delta. Also notice I put out of the money in, in blue to say, Unless you're a season trader or a day trader, don't start with a shorted in the money option because you can get in trouble. The other thing I did here is I just showed you the credit. So you subtract the premium you brought in by the premium that you paid for the long option, and it gives you $5.93. Also, all I wanted to illustrate here is I was illustrating how I look at average true range to predict or project the price. So because this was a couple of months out, I looked at what a monthly average true range was, and it was 188. So there's a low probability that when I first get into this trade that this 190 shorted option is going to be in the money or at the money. And I'll always look at the ATRs. In this case, a monthly, often I'll look at a daily and a weekly or two weeks if I'm doing a swing trade to just see how far this thing might go in my favor or against me. The other side is a vertical bull put credit spread. So all the parameters are the same, so I won't belabor that. Not going to belabor that, but just tell you that everything is basically the same, but you're using puts and you're bullish instead of using calls. And here is an example of a vertical bull put credit spread doing the similar type of thing. Okay, So we're doing the same thing, but in this side, we, this case, we are bullish. And again, I won't go through all this. You can take some time and look at it. But notice both of these options are out of the money. And here, notice that my del net delta is 0.22. And again, at that time, Apple Apple was bullish, so the calls are going to give you a little higher delta, net delta than the puts are. And that's why you're seeing that difference. Most of the time, I'm below 0.25. And again, the ATRs are the same. 
Now, there's many things that you can do. In fact, I teach a total, a whole edging thing. Actually, if you go to futuresmag.com, I have an article with an attached video that shows you how to hedge trades, how to hedge options trades, and it's free. I don't have the exact link to it uh, right right away here, but if you ever need that, you can email me, and I'll, I'll give you the link. And uh, there's actually a number of ways that you can deal with these credit spreads. What I'm illustrating here is all the inter alternative ways that we can deal with exiting these, whether they go against us or in our favor. So very, very flexible. Now, one other thing I'm going to show you is just how I would have combined, and this is the actual trade, how I combined both sides of that into an iron condor, and I get more of a net credit. Now, typically, Apple wouldn't have been your primary choice on this because what can happen with this is it's a bullish stock at the time. So if you're going to do this, you really need to know what you're doing and you have to be able to read charts. Many times I wing into each side of this. So actually with this trade in, in truth and honesty, I went into the put side first. Then when it hit resistance, I went into the call side. So you can go one wing at a time of these condors. This, if you had one contract on this trade, let's say you're just buying one contract, this is what this would cost you. The option requirement, because it was 40 points, is $4. And you would subtract the amount you brought in by the option requirement. So really, your only total requirements would be $2,800. And I gave an estimated commission on this. Now, I want to briefly talk about an example, and we're almost done, an example of an iron condor through earnings. Now, I've been doing these through earnings on Netflix. So Netflix was at $103 on the day of close of earnings. I heard a vertical bull put credit spread for a credit of 490, and I heard a vertical bear call credit spread for 440, bringing in a total credit of $930. These were 10 contract lots. Now, if you knew how to read options and, and open interest, this particular stock was not predictable of going as far as it went. And boy, did it go far. So why I'm showing you this is because guess what? One side of this went in my favor, the other side went against me. I'm going to show you what you do in this particular situation. So here's the trade. That was the trade. Kaboom. An inexperienced trader would probably have had a heart attack. Uh, you know, you sold puts, you sold calls. Well, remember now, the calls we sold here were the 125s, and we bought the 130s. And this little baby the next morning gapped up to about 142, somewhere around there. Forget what it was, 143. So now your little shorted option is now in the money. And you probably, again, would have had a heart attack if you had 10 contracts. But if you knew how to trade this, you would have had what I refer to as a dinosaur iron condor. So Netflix ends up around 145 that morning. So it was the morning after the earnings were announced that at, at the evening earnings were announced. So you close the put spread. I'm buying that back for five cents, basically, or $50. All right, now I have this vertical bear call spread that's now gone in the money because now it's above this. So what you do that morning, and based on that chart pattern, and if you listen to all our candlestick buddies here, they'll tell you that that's a very bullish pattern. And this is the day of after earnings came out, and you'll see a lot of dojis. This is a top. You look at that, it highly indicates that the stock's going to continue higher the next day. So what do you do? You go ahead and you close out that short option and think, holy smokes, it's a $21,000 that you got to cover that out. But remember, you own the other side of this, the 130. You wait one day, and at the end of the next day, you close out that 130 that you were long. This is how you manage these for $41,300. Your total profit on this when Netflix was at 170 is 2150 which is $21,500. That's how you manage a dinosaur iron condor. So you go in, things happen that you didn't expect, you watch it closely. Now, there were other ways to manage this, and trust me, I did several more put credit spreads on this. You could have even held this higher, but I'm showing you that you could turn one of these things into a dinosaur if you needed to. You better be careful, though, because dinosaurs can eat people based on the old movies. Most of them are herbivores, by the way. So I just wanted to show you an example. Yes, you bought back the short, and Brad said he did the same thing with LinkedIn yesterday. You buy back the out of the money. You hold in the money. Now, one thing I noticed, remember what I told you guys, be very, very careful that you look at your candlesticks. Use a gap with a doji the next day or a top, spinning top, will indicate it's going to go higher. If you're wrong, you just exit, or I would actually go to another whole strategy. 
Um, I teach many courses, and I'm not selling you any of these courses right now. If you want any information from me, and I'm going to tell you about a special we're going to give in just one second. If you want any information from me about these courses, about you want to talk to Blue Horseshoe, you just want to hang around with him in the pasture and eat some alfalfa, I'm dr.bluehorseshoe at yahoo.com. Feel free to, I'm very open to people. If 300 of you email me today, um, please give me some time to respond to you. Also, I'm very open with people and students. Also, the other thing I would please ask you is if you've got a huge question, um, I may not be able to answer that. This is just to ask some questions about the classes or a little bit about me. That's fine. But if you have something that really needs mentoring, <laughs> I'd suggest you set up some mentoring time because I've had people send me three-page analysis. It's like, I don't have time for that. So we're going to have a special for you today. DTI, I talked to Mr. Busby, Tom Busby, who is the owner of DTI. He agreed to something which I can't believe it. it was real late at night. I, I don't know how I got him to agree to this. He's going to offer, let me offer you DTI's Trader Edge DVD. He's also going to let me offer you one night, my Tuesday night. Every Tuesday night, I get together with my students for an hour, an hour and a half. I talk about certain stocks, and I talk about certain spread strategies, might be credit spreads. The past couple of weeks, I've been talking about earning strategies and different trades that they can take on earnings. Some may be iron condors, some may be debit spreads, some may be credit spreads. And I'll go through three or four of these a week during earnings. The cost for all of this would be about $250. And if you click on that link right there, you can get this for $5. So not only do you get, I think it's almost two or three hours of, of education on that Trader's Edge DVD, which talks a lot about markets and talks about um, uh, futures and the roadmap, but you also get to spend an evening with me. I would spend the five dollars just for an evening with me because the typical cost of this is one hundred and thirty nine dollars for four Tuesdays with me. So it's a wonderful time, and I am going to be talking about trades and I'm going to be doing what I usually do. Um, so it's basically about four hours of DTI training, both that uh, was recorded on the DVD that I'm not on that DVD, Jeff Smith is, and also four or five trades that I'll be talking about for the coming week. So basically, to close this out, because we're in a pub, I'm saying tip a few profits with DTI and Blue Horseshoe by just coming by, spending five bucks, and seeing what we do. And I would encourage you to do that. I know I'm running over. Um, and by the way, we also record that Tuesday night thing. Every, every Tuesday I record it for my students because some can't make it, so you're there. So I'm, uh, I'm sorry I've kind of run over here a bit. I don't want to interfere with the next presenter, but I tried to do it, cover as much of this to just show you one of the things I do. And I'm sure you've heard about the elephant trades here. Well, now you can say, guess what? Blue Horseshoe. Oh, by the way, Blue Horseshoe is a reference from the first Wall Street movie, and that's my alter ego. I have dual personalities. Uh, I'm Dr. Frank Stanley when I'm in the office, and I'm Dr. Blue Horseshoe when I'm trading. So if you ask for Frank, you may not find him. You've got to ask for Blue. So but, and only a psychologist can do that, by the way. So <laughs> no, there's no extra charge for this, guys. So I'm a comedian, too, so please bear with me on that, too. Um, but bottom line is let's tip a few. Let's try to be successful. And the whole thing I like to do is teach people how to be successful. Let's put some money in our pockets. Let's manage our portfolios. Let's get income trades. And with that, I know that I have to. It says on the checkout, the only mentioned DVD. Yes, the rest is included, uh, Jay. And it should be $5. So if it says 10, DTI will correct it. It is $5. You might have clicked it twice. It's $5, and the Tuesday is included with it. When you buy that, Morgan has assured me and some of the people at DTI that they will give you the link to my room on Tuesday night. So um, 